I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So what do you value most in life? What are you willing to die for? Well, the Beatitudes are familiar to many, particularly Matthew's account of Jesus' sayings. Few appreciate the meaning and the depth of these lines. The Beatitudes are either romanticized as words of praise for those who are poor, hungry, hated, and excluded, or they are seen as virtues for those who hope to win their inheritance in the heavenly kingdom. Few, however, appreciate the context in which Jesus preaches the Beatitudes. Yet the setting is critical to the story, particularly in Luke's version. Not only is the setting critical to our interpretation of the Beatitudes, so too is the larger chapter in which they are written. These are words not to soothe and comfort, but a prophetic call to awaken our hearts and respond to the injustice around us. They are, in every sense of the word, a decisive call to action and we are given a choice. Will you act today and love God's poor and beloved wounded, or will you wait for others to do it for you? To be blunt, if we took the Beatitudes serious, we would tremble in our seats. This is not some nice, cute story. This is a message for us to get up and do something now, not later, now. Let me explain. As I said, if we are to understand the meaning of the Beatitudes, we need to consider the chapter in which they are related to us. Chapter 6 of Luke's Gospel opens with a conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees, the legal experts of his day. First, Jesus' disciples find themselves hungry and without food. Concerned for their well-being, Jesus permits the disciples to gather wheat from the field, even though it is the Sabbath, and it is forbidden by the law. Then Jesus encounters a man whose hand is withered and who is desperate for a cure. Although the religious leaders and all the crowds clearly see the man in need of a cure, cure and some care and compassion, they do nothing but watch. Perhaps some even pretend that the man doesn't exist, or others hope that somebody will come along and help. But no one does anything for the man. To, to those, and to irritate to those watching from a distance and who consider themselves good and faithful people, Jesus heals the man. Even worse, he does it on the Sabbath. In each situation, the religious authorities of Jesus' day, and perhaps even the people around Jesus, question Jesus' priorities. Does he value the law as, it, as he ought? Is an obedience to the law mandatory for all? Why would Jesus bother himself with his disciples' hunger, or the man with a wounded hand? Wasn't it their fault? for not being prepared for the Sabbath? And did the man do something wrong that led to his hand being maimed? Well, everyone around Jesus obsesses with the obedience to the law. Jesus asks a question. Is it lawful to do good or to harm on the Sabbath? 
to save life or destroy it. In other words, what is most important to you? Life or death, good or evil? Are you going to act? Very early in the chapter in which the Beatitudes are at the core, Jesus challenges those around him to respond to the extraordinary need in the world and to consider what isn't truly important in life. Further emphasizing the point, Luke has Jesus leave the crowds, ascend a mountain to pray, and he commissions his 12 disciples as apostles. It's as if Luke is telling us, the listeners of the story, to pay attention to what is going on. This is important. If you want to know what we're about as disciples of Jesus Christ, you better listen and carefully do what Jesus commands his disciples to do. Immediately after the call and commission of the 12 apostles, Jesus with the apostles and the disciples, his friends, descend the mountain and they encounter a huge crowd, a multitude, thousands of people desperate for healing, for love, for compassion, for grace. And Jesus is moved. In one gospel it says he cries. He's so taken back by the need. So Jesus heals the wounded and the broken. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and this is the thing we all miss. He's not speaking to the whole crowd. He actually takes his disciples to the side and begins to utter blessings and warnings. How fortunate are you who place not your hope in vainglory, but trust in the providence of God. For the kingdom, the food of life, and everlasting happiness will be yours. But woe to you, and he's in the prophetic tradition here, woe to you, or how awful it is for you who ignore the poor, the hungry, the grieving, and instead build up your own treasures, fill your own stomachs, and you celebrate today. For you have won your reward. You shall have no part in the kingdom of God. Plainly speaking, Jesus forces his disciples and us to consider what is most important to us, our own wants and desires, or the life and goodness of all God's people, particularly those who suffer injustice. How we respond matters. The imperative of the gospel is action. Particularly in Luke's account of the gospel, the central account or theme of Luke's gospel is the ministry of Jesus and the work of the early church. It is about the prophetic mission of Jesus and his disciples, the church. Luke emphasizes, and I can't underline this enough, we, you really have to pay attention to Luke. For Luke, it's all about prophecy. And prophecy is not telling something in the future. Prophecy is living in word and action the good news. And all of us have a role in this. All of us. As Luke understands it, we share in the prophetic ministry of Jesus to heal the sick, feed the hungry, and love the brokenhearted. But for us to live into our prophetic vocation, we had to seriously ask ourselves, what is more important to us? Our own treasure, wealth, and prosperity? 
or the life of others. Luke clearly establishes that for us to be church, the disciples and living body of Jesus Christ, we must act. We must do as Jesus does and go out into the world, into the places of pain and suffering, and love people with the very heart and love of God. And this work belongs to all of us, no matter how young or old or how capable or whatever. All of us have this vocation. It is not a ministry simply for the specialists, for the bishops, the clergy, the lay ministers. This is the work of the entire church, everyone in this building. Everyone who considers themselves a disciple of Jesus Christ has a vocation to prophecy. All of us. And there's great need for healing in our world. More and more people are losing their homes while others prosper. Thousands of persons, young and old, wander our city streets desperately in search of a morsel of bread and warm shelter. It is appalling to see the lines of people begging to have a night of warmth. We complain about 10 minutes outside. There are people barely surviving in this night. And while our country celebrates Black History Month, Black persons experience an increased acts of racism, discrimination, and violence, perhaps worse today than ever before. Yet for many of us, we stand on the side and watch and wait and hope somebody else will do something about it. I'm going to speak frankly here for a moment. This past week I wrestled long and hard with this. I received a few angry emails and calls asking me why we have done nothing to commemorate Black History Month. One person wrote to me and said, it was a shame that I ignored all the work that had been done in the past and did nothing. To be honest, I was dumbfounded. Although I will honestly say I had no idea what was done in the past, it's not a single person came to me to talk about it. I still wondered, how could I miss something so important? Was it my own ignorance? Had I failed as a priest to lead where I should have led? Perhaps so. Maybe I've missed the mark and failed to have done what I should have done. I admit I'm no wonder worker, and I'll fully admit that I'm a sinner desperate in need of God's grace. All that being true, I still continue to try to listen to the stories of those who have suffered violence and injustice because of their ethnicity and race. But I need your help. I can't do that alone. I know, too, that this is a work all of us need to do. As Jesus did not work on his own, but rather gathered a community around him, a community of disciples and followers, and trusted them with the same mission, so too do we need to gather others around us. If we are to confront racial injustice, if we are to work for the rights of laborers, the poor, the disenfranchised, the marginalized, then we all need to commit to the work together. We cannot simply relinquish our responsibilities and expect others to do the work that God has called us to do, all of us, 
Everyone in this church, God has called you to this work. Not just me. All of us. The truth is, my friends, I cannot do this on my own. And I say this not to dismiss my own responsibility, but to admit my own need for help. Nor can our staff ministry team do it. Mary Lou, Thomas, Mervyn, Julie. We need you. The work of the church is entrusted to all of us. If we believe in caring for those who have suffered injustice, poverty, and hunger, and we believe that it is important, then we must all act. Our action need not be grand. It doesn't have to be something out of this world. It can be small gestures, small acts, sharing a story. Reaching out to somebody who's lonely, lost. Calling on our political leaders to truly work for the justice of all. But our action need not be done on our own. But ra rather, if each of us does one small thing in support of our goal, with faith and trust in the grace of Christ, then something great will come of our work. This is the work and mission of us all, not just the bishops, not just the priests, and not just the lay professionals, all of us. If you value life, if the gospel of life entrusted to us all by Jesus Christ is important to you, then act. Let us not seek to build our own treasures, to fill our own stomachs, or to lavish ourselves with rich celebrations and hope that others will do the work of God. Let us not seek our own treasure but rather, let us all work together so that all may have life and the abundance of life to the full and that no one shall ever live in fear because of who they are. Amen.